Trek Profiles Podcast, episode 30, recorded January 2020. This is the Trek Profiles Podcast, where each episode we examine one Star Trek fan's fandom story with this franchise that we both love so much. I'm John, your intrepid host of this whole enterprise, and I welcome you to this, the Trek Profiles Podcast, episode 30. If you wish to get in touch with us, you can reach us at feedback at trekprofiles.com or on Facebook or Twitter at Trek Profiles. Show notes for this and every episode are posted on the website, where I post all the links and more information about each and every show and guest. If you like what you hear on the podcast and you want to support us, please do make sure that you subscribe to the show via your preferred podcast platform. You can also drop us a rating and review on that platform if you would like. It would be very kind of you. Warning! As we record this, we are days away from the premiere of Star Trek Picard, so all previous Trek content up to and including that point may be discussed on this episode. You have been warned, human. As always, my co-host is the steely-eyed, stone-cold, and seriously solemn M5 Multitronic Unit. M5 is online. Show me the news and announcements, M5. Working. A little show trivia for all of you. This is one of the fastest turnarounds we've ever done here on Trek Profiles. This episode was recorded and pushed out in about a week, and usually these episodes sit around and marinate on my hard drive for at least 30 days, sometimes over 100. And that's mostly because of my travel schedule lately, but I thought you might enjoy that little peek behind the curtains here at Trek Profiles headquarters. In this episode, my guest has a collection of screen-used props that we talk about at one point, and I've posted pictures of all of those in the show notes, which you can find on the website at trekprofiles.com if you have an interest in checking those out. There are some lightly edited outtakes and bonus material at the end of this episode. They will come after the ending audio cards, so if bonus material is the kind of thing you might like, then this is the sort of thing you might like. A very brief production note, we're working on a secret plan for the episode that we're going to be dropping in March. It'll be something very different for this podcast, so stand by for that. All right, then, let's talk about Kobayashi Maru feedback. These are from episode 28 with Carlos Miranda. That's at Double Mac on the Twitter. Time to take a short jaunt in a shuttle from the 1701D. Will you take the Galileo or the Copernicus? Carlos boarded the Galileo, and so did all of you by 60 to 40 percent. Time to choose a hobby. Join a debate society with a bunch of Tellarites, or a computer club with a bunch of binars. Carlos digitally signed up for the computer club, but all of you on the Twitter poll selected the Pugnacious Tellarites by 63 to 37 percent. Choose a date for Captain Picard. Vosh, Crusher, Nella, Darren, or Eileen. Carlos wanted Picard to play Doctor, but in a hard-fought internet battle, Vosh crushed her opponents at 35% to the Doc at 31, Nella Darren was a close third at 28, and the Mind Ghost Eileen was in last place at 6. Time to choose some dinner while relaxing on Kronos. Will it be Rokeg Blood Pie or Heart of Targ? Carlos made the choice for the Blood Pie, and so did all the Tweeples by 59 to 41%. And finally, last question, step into the ring and choose your opponent. A very annoyed one of Species 8472 or a Borg drone with buzz saws for hands intent on assimilation. Carlos felt confident that the Borg drone would be the easier of the two opponents, but Twitter was not so confident, giving the Borg a narrow victory of 53 to 47%. As always, after each episode is released, I post these questions on Twitter as a poll. So follow me there at Trek Profiles, and you can have your say on this episode's questions. And that's all the news. M5, let's run the show. M5 Processing. Her favorite character is that coffee-swilling Captain Janeway. Her favorite ship is the USS Voyager. Those aliens that she loves the most are those wild and crazy Klingons. She's currently planning a Nemesis and First Contact rewatch, coming to you all the way from New Jersey, North America, Earth, in Sector 001. It's Marina Kravchuk. Welcome, Marina. Thanks for being on the podcast. Hi, John. 
This is wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure. Oh, it is absolutely my pleasure to have you on the show. But the M5 is telling me that it's time for question one. Marina, are you a Star Trek fan? Yes, I am. Thank you for confessing. Now that we have entered your confession (laughs) into the file, we can begin with our interrogatories. Now, Marina, I am aware that I probably pronounced your name incorrectly, and I want to apologize for that right up front. Will you please give us the correct pronunciation of your last name? Well, it should be pronounced Kravchuk. That's the proper way when you say it in Russian. But I have to admit that I am perfectly fine with people approaching me and saying Miss Kravchuk or any other way <laughs> that you can see fit, because I basically got used to it. Actually, everybody in my family, uh, that's the normal way that you would pronounce it when you see it. Uh, pretty much any English speaker would do that. So we're used to it. That's accepted. Uh, we never changed it when we got naturalized. So Marina Kravchuk, or if you can manage, Marina Kravchuk. <laughs> uh, so, so you'll answer to either. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's wonderful absolutely. to know. That's wonderful to know. So you indicate in your answer that that you're not originally from the United States. So are you, in fact, from Russia or from some other Russian speaking country? Technically speaking, Belarus. It's one of the former Soviet Union republics, the westernmost one it's between Poland and Russia geographically. Pri- primarily, yeah, most people speak Russian, but there are actually two state languages, Russian and Belarusian. For me, Belarusian at this stage is purely literary. I can still read in it. I can still write a little bit, but to be able to speak fluently would be a little bit more effort. So, But I speak Russian every day, my family and uh, some friends that I'm still in touch with. But so that's, you know, a lot of people, you know, kind of equate Soviet Union and Russia, same thing. It's not the same right. thing. But for the most part, it's like, are you Russian? A lot of times people like myself kind of like, yeah, meaning like Russian speaking primarily. So this leads me into my first question, which is, as a as a youth growing up in, in Belarus, was uh, or the, the Republic thereof, uh, was your first exposure to Star Trek under the Soviet regime and in Russian? No. Actually, I was extremely peripherally aware of it. It just, you know, I would come, uh, come across either a mention of it somewhere, and I had absolutely zero concept of what exactly it was. I mean, I understood that it was something that had to do with science fiction, but it was actually the other Star franchise that everybody at least a little bit heard of, which is Star Wars, and primarily because, well, it's much easier to steal movies. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm going to be explicit because that's the only way things were getting in the country. They were stolen, brought in, and then we would buy them on VHSs or, you know, this is before DVDs came along. All right. So it's and, all bootleg. Um, uh, yeah, so it's, it was not, television was not until they st- finally the licensing started to go through. You had legal venues and things opened up and you actually started uh, getting, you know, properly translated, actually both television and movies appearing. But before that, it was like, no, it's just there somewhere. Now, I realized at some point, and this was already way after Soviet Union was gone, that uh, there were people who were aware of it. Because I, I found out, I was like, oh, there was actually some sort of nascent fandom and people who were actually getting together and trying to dress up. And it wasn't, it wasn't just limited to Star Trek. It was also Lord of the Rings and possibly Star Wars. I'm not sure. But I just suddenly became aware of that. I was like, wow, I, this is just so far. And this was already when I was here. At the time, back home in the old country, no, no idea. So it, I came here with my family in 98. Mm-hmm. And I discovered track almost immediately, like literally within, I'd say, two, three months. So you were not a, a Star Trek fan when you came to the United States? No. Had no idea what it was. Okay. Uh, from zero to 100 in a very short And, and so what was your first exposure to, to watching it? I mean, 98 is not all that long ago. So can you remember the first episode you saw? No, but I suspect that it was either Let It Be Your Last Battlefield, because I remember thinking, oh, this is actually very clever, you know, the whole thing, black and white, white and black. Or it could have been, oh, I think the, the name of the episode is uh, obviously skips my, well, uh, Kirk talking to Alexander. Oh, Plato's Stepchildren. Yes, that's, oh God, thank you. It was one or the other. Because I remember like, oh, this is so, you know, it's very basic. I mean, at least it seemed basic because these are morality plays, as we know. At least the, the, the way the original series was set up. Mm-hmm. And, and then, of course, because I was watching so much television, it kind of helped to bring the language up to par, so to speak. I mean, I, I already spoke English, but it was very academic. So, I mean, I could write very well. I can read extremely well. But, you know, having that natural flow, I mean, I'm talking to you. I'm not thinking what I'm actually saying. It's just it's natural speech. But to get to that point took some time, I'd, I'd say probably about a year and a half. So watching television actually helped with the language. And so in a very brief period of time, I found 
the original series was doing reruns on PBS, whatever our local PBS station was. And then, of course, Voyager and was Is this still in on New the Jersey? Air. Yeah. Yeah. We, we came straight to New Jersey. We lived, used to live in Secaucus. So Voyager was still on the air. Deep Space Nine was in the last season. And funnily enough, TNG was the last out of those four that were sort of current at the time uh, that I discovered last. One of the student centers in a um, uh, college I went to, Rutgers University, had one of the rooms had... I think it was BBC America. I may be wrong. But the, same thing. They were just doing reruns all the time. Like 100% of the time, it was mostly track. <laughs> and so I got hit from all directions. It was like track, track, track. Now, it was very achronological. So a lot of the stuff, until I sort of hit that point of maximum saturation where it became like, okay, I need to know what's going on with all these things. Before that, it was like, oh, this is another fun one. Look at all these weird aliens. Because it was a chronological, for a while, my, my head was actually, like, like, I'll give you an example. I didn't know if Yar was actually dead or alive for quite a long time until I actually sat down and watched TNG from beginning to the end. Because I would randomly see all the episodes and it would be like, one episode, well, there's Tasha Yar, and then the next episode, she's not there. There's war. <laughs> so it's a little bit messed up. But I'd say within a period, probably about five years, that's when things kind of straightened out and I became, I call myself, you know, an armchair track fan because at that point it's like, yes, I was watching, I was going to the movies because we still had, uh, well, Insurrection came out in 98, right? Uh, could be, could be. We can look it up. but Years correctly. I think so. And then of course, Nemesis, but everything else was very much internet, reading books, and I had subscription to the communicator. That was my my little, super, super tiny little chamber of echo chamber of, of fandom and then of course you know things moved on and the social media exploded and then of course i got on the convention circuit and now it's something else entirely you know i feel like my, my fandom is occupying most of my <laughs> free time so matter of have you seen all of star trek as we sit here and record this in 2020 uh no i am not a completist i'm not sure if i want to be because i don't want it to become a chore oh i i enjoy watching track Naturally, you know, like if I feel like watching it, I'm going to watch it. If I feel like I need a break and not watch it at all. I mean, I'll still continue talking to people and going to conventions. But I had a like, was it last year or the year before? I realized at some point that I haven't watched single hour, if you will, of whatever, any of the series or anything. Oh, this was right before uh, Discovery actually premiered. So this was in 2017. Until September of 2017, I actually haven't seen anything for most of the year. It was just this, this sort of extended... I didn't just didn't feel like it. I mean, track was still part of it because I reading, keeping track of whatever the well, that characters, apologies, whatever the actors are doing, uh, going to conventions full time. But I just I just didn't feel like watching. So in that regard, I kind of I don't want to push it because I have a feeling that if I if I make it the chores, like okay, I'm sitting down and I'm watching, like I, I I know I have to rewatch Deep Space Nine. That's actually my own wish, but I need to make it sort of it doesn't become like oh, great. Eight o'clock, I must sit down and watch a couple of hours. I don't want to become a chore. What What are you missing as we sit here? Uh, I've never seen... <laughs> don't throw anything heavy at me. I haven't seen a single episode of animated series. I suspect I'm missing... Okay. Probably somewhere between five and ten episodes of the original series, believe it or not. Probably because I never did okay. a chronological view. I just... I'm pretty sure that I, I saw 80 out of 88. Let's, let's limit it that. I only saw first season of Enterprise. Probably maybe three, four episodes out of the fourth season. I mean, I did see the finale. And that's it. Every, otherwise, everything else I saw. I haven't seen season seven of Voyager. So you're, you're talking to someone <laughs> that's in the same boat. I haven't seen but it all yet either. There. You, you're going to get there. Yeah, you're going to get I, there. <laughs> I, I'm going to get there, but I'm, I'm kind of slowing down a little bit. I, I, I kind of want to ration it out. I, I feel like I don't, mm -hmm. I don't want it to end. So there's times where I've actually sat down and said, oh, I think I'm going to watch Star Trek tonight. I'm going to watch Voyager. Uh, and then yeah. I'd be like, no, I think I'll go watch something on Netflix. Not because I don't want to watch it. It's just I I just like having some you, stuff in reserve. You want it to end. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah. and it's I'm in, and I'm enjoying Voyager tremendously, but I just I just haven't gotten there yet. Uh, but you brought up something I, I want to return back to for just a second, which is. I see on some of these forums that I hang out in and on social media, I'll see the uh, at least a weekly message 
from someone who will say, oh, I'm a new Star Trek fan. Please give me the correct order and and the viewing order with like the annotated yeah. stuff. And I keep saying, like, do not mess with that. There are people who are going to give you a viewing order and my point of view and, you know, people are free to disagree. And please, I'd love to know your opinion. But I always say yeah. it literally does not matter. Even like some of them, I would say Discovery is a little bit different. But Deep Space Nine, you know, even that one, which is supposedly serialized, you can jump in and watch it anywhere because I think a lot of people in original broadcast did exactly that and started watching it in season six mm -hmm. and enjoyed the heck out of it. Yeah. So don't even obsess about this viewing order business that's a that's a modern tv thing and you're just putting it where it doesn't belong yeah but I, I absolutely agree with it star trek is so different in every every entity that came out in the franchise that whatever catches you you have to find it for yourself you know in my case like i said i i basically the original series was this little thing that i discovered but it's really, really literally i had basically this weekly thing that i would watch voyager and deep space nine because they were together on at the same time and it was Voyager that caught me. Why? Well, I have a couple of ideas, and it took me probably about a decade to to figure out <laughs> why Voyager. But that's what caught me. Sometimes people do ask me, you know, especially like new folk that I meet at the conventions, and they're like, you know, I'm just getting into this sort of thing. You know, what do you recommend? It, realistically, you know, for those who are just completely, well, almost terrified, because let's face it, I mean, we are talking about 50 years of stuff, you know, between the actual series and the movies. And the interviews and the books. Oh my God, the books! So many. I always say, like you know, if you wanna, if you wanna just just start with a movie because at least movie is easier to digest, if you will. And my favorite to recommend is always First Contact. It just seems a little bit more modern. It still holds up. But oh, but see, there, hold on, again, Rita, because there there are people who are going to jump on you saying, well, you cannot watch, watch First Contact until you watch Best of Both Worlds Part One, Part Two, and Part Three, which is called Family. Yeah. Uh, and, so mm. I, I know it's a, it's an argument that's out there and people yeah. have to argue about this stuff, but I get the spirit of what you're oh, saying. I, I'd agree I've with it. I've seen people. Yeah. Yeah. But generally speaking, uh, as like, you know, as an, uh, an overall opinion, you have to find something that will catch you because whatever that catches me is, is not going to be the same that will be special for you or for, for the next person or for my own sister, you know, like we, we have very similar tastes, but uh, you know, she has her own favorites. She discovered them for herself. My question for you is, who recruited who into the fandom first? <laughs> I did. I found Star Trek first, and so we're talking 98. And I introduced it to her because she said, well, let's go out together and do something. Why don't we go see that new movie that came out? And at that point, the new movie was Nemesis. So despite what people may think, we actually rather enjoyed sharing the experience together. And I just kind of gave them like, okay, I'll, I'll tell you later what this whole thing is about. And, and she was like, just shut up and let me watch the movie. And she enjoyed it. And at the end we came out and she was like, what's such a terrible thing with the, that guy dying and everything. And then so little by little she discovered. So for her, I suppose, entry was through TNG rather than Voyager. But funnily enough, as I said, we share a lot of stuff. Her favorite uh, series are also Voyager and The Next Generation. There you go. And then, and she, but she just, she arrived at that by herself through her own experience, you know, sitting down and watching stuff uh, already on Netflix, actually. And then, of course, I introduced her to conventions. Uh, so he, she started big. Her first convention was uh, STLV uh, 2011. So that was the 45th anniversary, which at the time was the biggest track convention. And now that we're just sharing this all the time, so which makes it perfect. We always have gifts for each other because yeah, I don't need to break my brain to figure out what, what can she possibly want. You know, just find another neat Star Trek thing. <laughs> Oh, that's fantastic. Now, do you do you watch Star Trek together or do you kind of just do your own thing? I wish. Unfortunately, she works and lives uh, in Pennsylvania, so it's very difficult to actually arrange to do something. For the most part, we, we try to share uh, conventions. So uh, STLV is our 10th poll event of the year. We, we always do that together. Uh, but we do have plans. So as of this recording, we're in January. Picard is about to premiere our we planned it. So 23rd, we're going to be together watching, and I'm actually going to break open a bottle of Chateau Picard that I got from Star Trek Wines and uh, going to raise the toast and uh, see what it's all about. I can't wait. Uh, we have similar plans, Marina, because that's exactly what I'll be doing as well. Okay, so we're, we're going to talk about conventions in a little bit, but first I want to talk about collections. Uh, I know that, that you're a collector mm -hmm. of photo ops, and things like that. Uh, so tell us about your Star Trek collection. Uh, if we were to crack open your treasured box of Star Trek items, what would we find in there? 
Oh, it's more in the order of bookcases at this point rather than boxes. And it's in the horrible need of, um, I need to go through everything and really take a look at what I accumulated over the years. Because it seems like, well, it's only been, what, 21 years, but it's a little bit horrifying. Uh, I suppose everybody kind of goes through that stage where you see something in the store that has Star Trek written on it and you immediately go, I, I think I want that. And then, of course, you become far more selective because you realize, well, I really rather enjoy doing this, you know, like, say, collecting autographs or uh, buying books or something like that. So for me, it started from buying books. I discovered a bunch of uh, pocket books, um, Voyager and TNG ones, I think, in the local library. I'm like, oh, this is wonderful. I didn't know that there were books. I just, I knew there were series. That was that. And so I went to the bookstore. I'm like, well, let's see what's there. And I started collecting pocketbooks. So that was my first little thing. And then it kind of progressed into actually, you know, getting some of the collectibles, like the action figures, for instance. And then, of course, convention started. And that became, yeah, I, I have quite a lot of autographs and photo ops at this stage. And uh, some of the stuff that, you know, lithographs, I, I enjoy collecting, like really nice posters. Unfortunately, I can't display them at this point because they're, they became, there are far too many of them. So carefully wrapped and documented and they're all in my closet. Um, I do have some of the stuff that I, I was lucky enough to come across that are actually production used materials. So um, I have a couple of props. Uh, from Voyager, actually, that I'm very proud of. And um, a lot of very random stuff. Then all of a sudden, you know, like you, you find, especially, you know, eBay in that rig, eBay in that regard is your friend because sometimes you can come across the most amazing things. So tell us about the props. Oh, the props. Well, let's see, it's, it, uh, I call it my small tool collection. It's a seams beacon from Timeless. It's not possible to say if that's the one that Kim wears or Chicote wears because obviously they... It just it's a prop. <laughs> so whoever was holding it, one of them was holding it. But it's a screen used. Is, it's it's was used on screen. It, it is screen. Yeah. And it actually still has um, uh, it came via it's a uh, it's a wrap, which was the company. Uh, I believe they were organized by the Akutas, but it was, they, they did auctions. They auctioned off whatever was remaining after that huge Christie's auction. I'm not quite sure if there was it just was minor things that were remaining after they went through all the boxes at Paramount, I would have to look into it. But basically, Christie's got all the major stuff, you know, the hero ship models and the, the captain's uniforms, you know, all the big stuff. Smaller things became part of its wrap auctions. And so whoever was the first owner, I'm not sure. I do have the certificate and everything. And the prop did come with, is it Andrew Probert's handwriting? I think it is. Uh, but it basically describes what it is, what kind of battery it needs, and it's it's still attached to the seams beacon. So uh, all I have to, it's still working. I just have to get, it's a B battery, I think. I just have to get the battery, and I can actually walk around with an actual seams beacon. <laughs> but Very uh, nice. I'm actually trying not to, not to disturb it too much, so it's, it's nicely in the little glass box that I found for it, so I can just, you know, occasionally look at it and marvel. But the very first prop that I actually did acquire and that was actually cracks me up a little bit because it turned out to be an, a real life object, but it's a prop. In Voyager episode Revulsion, the isomorph, the mad isomorph, has this hammer tool that he basically uses to attack Balana and everything. And, it, you know, it's a nice, nifty looking thing. And it's actually very hefty. I was told that this, it, it used either in is it masonry something? But it's it's a real life tool. The actual hammer bits that's actually a handle. It has this, this orange rubber things that go on top, and that's where you hold it. So what it does precisely, I would love to know. But you know, you remove the orange bits. It's an alien hammer. It's perfect. Same thing. I have a nice display for it, and came with all the documentation and everything. And the last thing. Uh, is a spider hunting tool from Gravity. Again, it's not something that they would tell you, oh, Tuvok was holding it. No, but it's 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 an actual thing. And <laughs> they took a screwdriver by the looks of it and they just put the fancy handle on it and basically weld it like an additional thing to make it like this tripod looking tool so you can poke something with three holes. But I, I love discovering this because I was looking and I'm like, oh my God, there are actually markings on this. It's a screwdriver. It's like number four Phillips or something like that. Perfect. So it's a fun thing to... There is a book, uh, Aliens and Artifacts, written by Michael Westmore. And the section about props, they actually have something that, about that, that you find something that has a funky handle or an interesting shape. It's a real life object that looks good enough, weird enough, heavy enough, hefty enough, whatever. And then you modify it and boom, you have a Star Trek prop. So I, it's it's a great thing and it's wonderful things. I'd love to, uh, I would love to have more items, but 
these are the actual props and I'm really, really happy to have them. <laughs> That's great. You know, if you want to send me uh, photos of those, I'd be happy to post them on the show mm -hmm. notes page if you want to show them off. I think that'd be great. I think the listeners would enjoy that. Mm -hmm. All right. So what was your best, or I don't want to say best, which photograph, photo op, do you enjoy looking at the most? The five captains, because it's just so unreal. It happened. The fact that it happened at all is, is almost a miracle. Now, just to give a background, um, 2012, the biggest news was Star Trek convention was coming back to Europe, well, just specifically to UK in this case. They haven't had one in over a decade. Uh, I believe the one previous that was like 2001 in Blackpool. Uh, I could be wrong, but it's basically it's been ages. And so, and the hugest announcement that they made is that we're going to have all, all captains. Now, 2012, all five captains, we only have five captains, meaning five captains in the starring roles. So that hasn't happened before. Huge thing. And I was actually seriously considering going, but at that point it was just impossible money-wise between the cost of the tickets and the flight and the hotel. It just... Not viable. And I was like, well, okay, uh, I will watch from afar. I mean, we still have our STLV and then all the other things happening. Yeah, we'll experience it vicariously through my convention friend. And then they announced four of the captains for Wizard World's uh, Philadelphia Comic Con in, um, uh, this is June, early June. And I was like, well, great. 2012. Although at least I'll have the experience. Yeah, 2012. And the gentleman who has something to do with Wizard World, was present at the Cherry Hill Convention, which is one of the smaller creation Star Trek conventions they used to have. Cherry Hill is right on the border between New Jersey and, and uh, Pennsylvania, right across the river from Philadelphia. And he was there and he was like, you know what, uh, just to give you an update in case you were, I mean, in case you're thinking about going, I said, I am going, I already have the tickets and everything. He said, we might have all five. Just, you know, keep it on the down low. It might happen because they're not sure. They're, they're trying to get Patrick to come. He's, he's filming. I think he was filming probably one of the X-Men movies at the time. It's, just, it's a possibility. It might not happen. It might happen, but keep it in mind. Like, okay. And then, of course, within two weeks of that, the news explodes. Like, yeah, there are going to be five captains way ahead of Destination London. And it's going to be happening in Philadelphia. And there's going to be photo ops and everything. That still remains the single most expensive admission ticket that I had and single most expensive photo op, uh, which is saying something considering how prices have been going up and up and up for big events over the last 10 years. So I went and that's what it happened. Interestingly enough, Destination didn't have the five captain photo op, which kind of, I always thought that was a very strange thing. I mean, they had the duos and single photo ops, but not the, so the only time Anyway, if you ever see somebody else with a five captain photo op, they were at, in Philadelphia in, in June of 2012. That's the only time that it ever happened. And of course, now that um, Avery Brooks is no longer directly involved with the franchise, it's not going gonna, not gonna to happen ever again. So that was that's the most unique thing and uh, one of my favorite photo ops. Every time I look at it, I'm like, I can't believe it actually happened. It took me months to pay it off, but it's priceless. I want to ask you mm -hmm. about the fact that you do photo ops and you also said you do autographs. So Yes, and actually started out with autographs more than photo ops. For some reason, it just I thought that that's a great thing because it allowed some time to actually to to you know have a little bit of a chat, even though um when I just started I was terribly well, in some cases, I was terribly starstruck. First time I met Leonard Nimoy, I was just like literally mute. You know, I just handed my photo. He signed it. I said, thank you. And that was that, that was the extent of interaction. But then it got better. And now, especially at Comic-Cons, you do have more, you know, when you go up to a table, sometimes you can just stand there and chat for five, 10 minutes if there's not that many people behind you or no people at all. So, uh, and then I it kind of transferred and photo ops became more special, probably because, well, I mean, how many times can you do autographs, said the person with more than 20 autographs from Kate Mulgrew. But there you have it. You know, the, the, you know photo op becomes a sort of uh, a moment that you can at least kind of show off and say, hey, check out this photo. In 2020, you, you do photo ops. You don't really do the autographs anymore, if I understand. Uh, I still collect. If it's somebody that I've never met before or if it's um, if I have something that's special enough that I think of oh, that, that would be a great you know, poster or photo or something else for signing, I will do that. So for instance, we do have folks coming in already at this point as we're recording, I think there we have just under 40 people, 40 guests announced for STLV. And there's three or four actors that I've never met before 
And some of them, like, for instance, um, uh, Karen Austin is going to be there. She played uh, Bolana's mother. Fantastic. I, I actually, I love, it's one of my favorite episodes, Barge of the Dead. So I am, she's definitely signing my encyclopedia for that one. Oh, that's great. Have you ever done a cosplay? Uh, yes. Only uniforms. I have a first contact uniform and a Voyager uniform. First contact one is the <laughs> poor man's version from China. It looks good enough. I actually got lucky. Whoever made it did a decent enough job. It still fits me, actually, even though I, I have to admit I gained some weight, so my Voyager uniform has to wait. The Voyager one is from Anovas. Again, I got lucky. As we all know, Anovas had quite a few problems fulfilling orders, but I got mine uh, when they were doing like, some sort of a, a huge sale of, of the whatever existing stock that they had. So it's like literally it was guaranteed that that's the stuff that they have. And plus it was on sale. So luckily enough, so I got, it's just the jacket and the, uh, the turtleneck. Um, and I used, actually I only have, I, I mostly used the first contact one for the, uh, for the photo ops. So I have I have the cast photos with TNG and Voyager casts, even though I am wearing a Voyager uniform in uh, the Voyager one. That was actually a really really bad one. That was another one. It was like the, I, I I got it online and it was good enough for the photo, but it was actually deeply uncomfortable to wear. Uh, so unfortunately, I actually I never got a chance to wear a Novus one in uh, photo ops. I will get there because it's it's really I I keep looking. I'm like this is like a real thing, you know. The color is all right and the cut is perfect. So I'm. I'm hoping to uh, start wearing it again once I drop a few pounds. <laughs> so you've made reference as we've been talking to a lot of your convention going. And uh, for those who don't know, yeah. uh, you're a huge convention goer. So uh, you even podcast about it on the wonderful Shore Leave podcast, which uh, if anyone out there is interested in going to Star Trek conventions, I would heartily endorse mm -hmm. them listening to what you do with uh, our friend Jesse. And it's just fantastic. But I want to go back in time. And what was the very first uh, fandom convention that you ever went to? And what induced you to go to it? That was the uh, one of the small creation, creation conventions here in New Jersey. Uh, this was in 2009. I, I, it had an official name. It was something like a Northeast Convention, something that is in Parsippany, New Jersey. Parsippany happens to be 10 minutes away from where I live, uh, well, still live right now. Uh, so at that point, my family already moved moved away from Secaucus. And I remember finding a flyer in a um, uh, Borders bookstore. <laughs> Rest in peace, Borders. And I thought, <laughs> wow. At that, point, at that point, that was the only experience, really, in my fandom. As I said, I was an armchair fan for a very long time. I'm like, well, I've, I, I really need to check this out. Plus, you know, there were... You know, it was headlined by Leonard Nimoy and Kate McGrew. So it was like, oh, well, great, Spock and Captain Janeway. I mean, what? How, how can you beat that possibly? So um, especially, I have to admit, Kate McGrew, I've been, I've been dying to meet her. And so I went and I had absolutely zero idea. I mean, I, I studied the you know, frequently asked questions section. So I knew I'm like, at least I, I read the small print, <laughs> so to speak. At least I'll be somehow prepared. And then I just watched other uh, fans attending. You know, that person bought the uh, auction, you know, sorry, action figure to, you know, for signing. Great. I have the autograph ticket. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to buy an action figure. And that person is doing the photo ops. And how do you photo ops? So I just basically observed everybody else. And and that was that. And then, you know, it was only, I only did two days out of three. I did Saturday and Sunday. And it was over. And I'm like, this is the most amazing thing that ever happened to me. How did I not, you know, why didn't I do it earlier? And I actually, I deeply regret that I didn't do it earlier. I could financially afford to go to Vegas probably sometime, like maybe for a couple of years before that. But at that point, you know, the uh, experience just closed. Experience closed in 2008. So I was like, well, why should I even bother going then? You know, and it's so stupid, right? I, right now I'm like having the experience of 10 years of going at STLV. I'm like, what was I thinking? But yeah, 2009, that tiny but, little Marina. convention that had like maybe, yeah. You are you are talking to a guy who lives in Vegas, and there were years that I did not go, <laughs> which in retrospect <laughs> yeah. seems very strange to me. <laughs> oh, it's it's it seems it seems ridiculous. I mean, I know that SLV was quite different at the time, but still, I mean, with experience, it would have been the experience, you know, with a capital E. But uh, you know, I, I had like I said, I had very little idea. I was kind of like finding things for myself. I I didn't really know anyone in the fandom. I mean, at this point, my, my existence within Trek was very solitary. I was just reading my magazines, reading my books, and, you know, keeping track of whatever was coming up on the fan pages online. That was that. 
And uh, so, yeah, 2009 changed everything. So I got to meet, it was a very small convention. It had about, I think, 12 or 13 guests. So, um, like I said, I met Kate. That was incredible. And, of course, that was, we only had a couple more years of um, Leonard doing appearances. Um, so that was very special. And that's it. Next year was my first Vegas, and it just exploded from then on. Uh, I did just like one or two conventions a year for a couple of years, and right now I do on average probably between five and seven, five seven a year. The biggest five one and I've ever seven. Done, yeah, uh, two years ago I think I did nine, but that's counting. That's different sizes. Oh my goodness! That's, that's going from the monster like New York Comic Con, which is quite an experience and it's you know it's, it's completely insane to uh you know like the small signing events that we have here in new jersey where it's like they're calling it the convention but it's more like just people convening so they can get their stuff signed and you know they only just now started doing actual photo ops otherwise it's just mostly selfies but it's a nice way to to actually meet very unusual people i mean we have this one um called chiller theater it's been around for ages and it's anyone and everyone even though it started out, I think is more like a horror-oriented event. Right now, it's any genre goes. I mean, I've met Japanese actors, and I've met. I mean, I saw Penny Marshall once at you know Joan Collins. Oh, so it's like anyone and everyone can show up at Chiller. Yeah, and then of course, like I said, you get these monsters like New York Comic Con or, well, Philadelphia is quite big. Chicago Comic Con is quite big. Denver Comic Con. So um, it's fun to explore unusual events. So. What is it about the convention experience in general that appeals to you so much? It started out with meeting guests. I think it start, probably starts out that way from most people when you're like, okay, I actually have a chance to meet that one. Well, <laughs> I'm sure it probably starts out like I, I can meet that one character. And then it becomes like, oh, I can actually meet the actor. And then it became as I met more people that that is probably the single most important thing that conventions meant for me both within fandom and just generally the way they affected my life is that it gave me friends and so many friends i can't even count how many at this point so right now it's like yeah i'm going somewhere and i can just say i'm gonna be at radon comic con and i know for a fact there's gonna be 5 10 15 people is gonna say okay great see you there and we can meet up hang out have a dinner together talk about stuff and it's just the most amazing thing so it kind of progressed from purely technical aspect it's like okay come on and meet the guests do the photo ops go through the motions to actually making friends socializing well i just want to say as a as an interesting aside that that's actually something that we've had the chance to do yeah because your work is not that far from where i have to go in new york city from time to time because uh, that's where where my work is headquartered yeah and uh you we've had the chance to meet up a few times and you've introduced me to your New York uh, away team and they're just the most delightful mm -hmm. people. So it's been uh, fantastic for me. So thank you for that. Well, thank you. And it, it's, it's always great. It's, it's something that I, I really treasure about the, the away team is this, this whole concept of like getting together between conventions. It's not only just conventions right now. It's just a generally, it's, it's kind of like a club only without having any kind of formalizing uh, constraints to it. So yeah, it's fantastic. So if anyone's thinking about coming to New York, you know, give a yell and we'll, we'll try to do a get together at our usual hangout at Times Square and it's wonderful. So what is your favorite thing about the really big conventions, the, the comic cons? I don't know if you'd put STLV in that category or not, but of the really big conventions, what, what is the best thing that you would, that you like, or that you might recommend to someone who's never been to say, it, you know, you should go to these because of this? Uh, just experiencing the variety and diversity because people have very uh, like the ones who, who are not who are kind of like blinded even though like let's face it pop culture is very much mainstream right now this whole thing with that's why we have these monster conventions a whole lot of people are more aware of them and we have this giant movies between you know marvel universe and all that so it's it's far more visible so you have far more exposure and far more many more people attending but still there's plenty of folks who like you know it's still that concept of people weird people dressing up and behaving strangely. It, it's not. It, uh, I love people watching. I'm, I'm okay with large crowds, probably because I'm, you know, I work in New York City. So New York Comic Con is tiring by virtue of its size and the noise and the amount of things, you know, to see. But, you know, you, you stand in the crowd and you just look around and just take a look at the people. It's like every shape, form, color you can possibly think. It's like you're looking at the world. And that that is just incredible. 
I mean, I, sp- I suppose, you know, New York kind of being by virtue of multilingual and multinational and multiracial and everything, it's, it's a little bit easier. But I noticed that at other Comic Cons as well, it doesn't matter if it's a mid-sized one and say Montreal Comic Con. I really liked it. And it's, you get the same thing at a smaller scale, but it's still you get a lot of diversity, lots of different folks showing up, whether they're dressed up or not. So yeah, it's it's the the large comic cons are quite unique in that way. We have the same thing, even though uh, STLV is not comparable size wise. Where it's it's much much smaller if you compare it to say New York Comic Cons, <laughs> apples and oranges size wise. Mm-hmm. But we have that because because it's Star Trek. It's sort of it's almost built in in a way. I read this wonderful article. Somebody attended STLV and they said they were not shocked, but they were incredibly impressed by that. That you have this this variety, all genders, all ages, all all colors, all shapes doesn't matter, and it was like this giant family reunion. That's actually my my single favorite thing about that Sylvie right now. That's yeah, I can't wait because it's that's going to be a family reunion coming come August. That's right. No, I'll see you there this year. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to go last year because I had a yeah. a problem last year at the last minute that I wasn't able to attend. But uh, and it really, it really hurt me because I knew all my friends were in town right across the city and yeah. I was unable to see all of you guys. <laughs> so uh, but we'll we'll be on for this year for sure. Oh, I can't wait. And there's a lot to celebrate. It's always a delight to see you. Yeah, and there's a lot to celebrate. So yeah, indeed, 2020 is going to be special. So, what is it about the smaller conventions, the the smaller neighborhood things that are sort of regional? Uh, what what would you recommend about those, or what makes them different from the bigger ones? They're far more intimate. That's the that's the thing that comes to mind right away. Uh, you definitely, if if you do have celebrity guests attending, you certainly have far more opportunities to actually have a less frenzied access to them so it's not like you know being rushed because there's a thousand people queuing behind you in the photo op you know it's going to be far more relaxed the signing is not going to be oh come on guys we're on the time here and the person has to leave because they have to plane to catch no the, the guest is probably there at least for a day and you have instead of two thousand people you have 200 people or even smaller like the smallest convention i ever went to have had uh, 150 people there that's like a drop in the water compared to pretty much any other convention I can think of. And yeah, so you can just literally go up and then wander about and then go up again and have this wonderful conversations. Now, yes, of course, the big, bigger names are probably not going to show up at smaller events. But then again, it depends on like what's, what's the definition of a bigger name. I mean, we're talking probably like all this whole thing with A-listers, B-listers as far as Hollywood defines actors. But still, if there's one thing I've learned from doing this show, it's that that different fans get different things from the show. And Mm -hmm. whether or not someone gets a bigger billing in a cast has nothing to do with whether or not seeing that actor is or that creative or whoever it is, is meaningful to you. Right. There's people who are like, oh, my God, I would just die if I met Garrett Wang. Right. Because his character meant something to me when I was watching Voyager. And that could be a bigger thing than meeting, you know, his royal Shatness. Right. It it all depends on on where you are in your fandom. Yeah, absolutely. And I just it's if you, you know, those people who do not like large crowds. And yes, it's not something that if you've never been to a, like a really large comic con, it's very hard to imagine how you would react when you're literally standing there and there's not like thousands of people. There's like literally tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people. It's a very, very different perception. Uh, so yeah, it's a smaller crowd, smaller, more relaxed flow of things when you actually can you can hear yourself think. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's 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 a very different experience, and I think it's very nice to actually have that. Because, as I said before, things started to blow up uh, over the last, um, I'd say probably about eight years, geometric progression. Like the, a lot of the very big conventions, like literally blowing up in size, and I don't even know where they're going to fit if they keep going at the same rate. It's, it's, it's becoming quite, quite extraordinary to experience that. But still, when you have this retro style conventions, the way things were 10, 20, 30 years ago, I mean, there are still conventions going on. They've been around for like 40 years. And it's kind of nice to experience it. It's like this little hidden gems. We can kind of, not, not like to, to make it sound like, oh, it's, it's yesterday's. No, they, they still, they invite, you know, everybody who's, who's on right now, whichever genre it may be, uh, you know, like Shore Leaf or Starbase Indie. Those are nice, but it's a different flow of things and you, you get experience a different side of conventions rather than this uh, frenzied, super duper, ultra modern, you know, like what we get, like industry events such as San Diego and New York. 
the apples and oranges. It's nice to experience both kinds. You, you just mentioned Starbase Indy, so let me just say that as we record this, it's uh, January 2020, and last month on Shore Leave, your uh, convention podcast, yeah. you just released an episode with our friends Debbie and uh, Eric uh, about Starbase Indy, and I just want to recommend to any of our listeners that if you want to get the sense of what these smaller conventions are like, if you've never been to any, uh, you should check out that episode where they talk about Starbase Indy, and it really is something that's just in a hotel, and it was a really great episode, so I just want to encourage anybody to check that out if you have an interest. Thank you, John. Yeah, that, that, was, that was very nice to talk. Yeah. Marina, I'm going to suggest we start talking about some episodes. What do you say? <clears throat> Absolutely. Let's do it. So let's go ahead and start by talking about A City on the Edge of Forever, TOS Season 1, Episode 28, written by that giant in uh, uh, sci-fi fandom, Harlan Ellison. Certainly an episode that comes to a lot of people's top lists. Uh, and the M5 suggested that we should talk about this episode because it was meaningful to you in some way. Mm -hmm. So please tell me uh, why this episode is on the list. What? Why did the M5 put it here for us to talk about? I'm sure there's a lot of people have talked about this. I mean, it is considered to be one of the best ones, even though uh, those people who were present when Harlan Ellison was a guest at the STLV, you will know that he has a, he had, apologies, he had a very, um, well, he had a lot of things to say, because as, as we know, a lot of the original content was actually not there, it was rewritten a lot for the actual screenplay. But it, along with several other episodes, which I gave you, I found, as I was kind of trying to analyze why would I pick this one, along with everything else, I find that I, uh, anything involving time, uh, you know, I don't find it like a hackneyed cliche. A lot of people are sort of against this. Oh, we have the time travel again. And and it's, I find most time travel stories in Star Trek in particular are actually very well written. They're wonderful concepts. And it kind of falls into that. This whole idea of the, the multiverses, this, this multiple ways of the butterfly effect of, you know, going in the past and changing this one thing, and then you have these consequences that will explode somewhere in the future in a major way. I always thought that that was such a great, probably my favorite time travel concept. When I was, I think I was probably about 12 or 13, I, first time I read The Sound of Thunder by Bradbury. Mm -hmm. That's actually an example, the pure example of the butterfly effect. That's when I kind of like, this is just a terrifying thing. I mean, that used to be probably my favorite sci-fi story for, for, for years. But it kind of falls into this whole thing. Pretty much all the time travel uh, episodes that I pointed out. And sitting at, at the edge of forever, it kind of falls into that same category. I always thought how fascinating this is that you have this one linchpin, this one person, you know, whose who's death, as a matter of fact, tragically, can have that sort of impact. She was a pacifist, but she was a pacifist at the wrong time. And of course, you know, you do have this personal thing because you feel for Captain Kirk losing his love. So it's it's um, it's a great episode. I believe Harlan Ellison wasn't... He was okay with DC Fontana, I think, rewriting it. But I think... <laughs> I read an interview with him somewhere where he, I think he kind of mentioned something online. Nice. He still would have preferred not to have his name on it. Which is kind of like, you would think, oh my God, but it's the city on the edge of forever. How can you say that? And yet, yeah, here we have... That that kind of uh, that kind of situation. I, I would recommend to any listeners out there that if you want to get Harlan's own opinion on this, uh, his I, I think it's his estate or some people associated with him. It's definitely something that he controlled. Are selling this audiobook version, mm -hmm. and it has him talking about it. And I bought that at STLV. Actually, his, his folks yeah. had a booth there. And, mm -hmm. and I bought that audiobook uh, with all the commentary. And literally the first 45 minutes of it is nothing but him haranguing uh, about yeah. what Gene did to the episode and how much he yeah. hates it and all this. And, you know, you, so you'll get his perspective. But I will say yeah. that the story that he wrote is wildly different than what we Completely. saw. Completely. Yeah. I, I have I have the uh, the book, the not the audio book. I have the actual screenplay printed. Because he brought it with him at STLV. So I have this and I had him sign it and everything because he actually he refused to sign any to sign anything that was not written by him. I was kind of hoping to for him to sign something else. And, and he said, I'm very sorry. I, I can't I, I, I don't like to do that. He's an incredible person to meet. <laughs> just the, the, the power of the mind. I mean, he was on the stage. It's like the, the language, the everything about him. Uh, but it, aside from that situation, the episode itself is is utterly brilliant. It just it's it, 
it, it in many ways it's it's simple i suppose you could say i mean this whole idea but the it, the com- it, but complex it's simple but complex and i love it and it just kind of like i said it falls into that particular category of time travel stories that i find especially like the whole idea of like uh, have you read the the sound of thunder it's like literally a person goes I back not. in the future goes back in the future and steps on a butterfly comes back and the future is this fascist horrible place and he actually gets killed but it's just it this you know he's like oh my god it's just a butterfly and then even though he has a butterfly that's not actually something that generated that whole concept of butterfly effect it comes from uh, somebody else's definition but it's an example of it where you have this one tiny little action in the past that can just set off the dominoes falling and we have it many times i mean that's how pretty much every other time most time travel stories in track are you have to go back in the past to fix the future. I was uh, reading some books over the holiday, and I was on a was on a cruise with my family, and I brought a whole bunch of dead tree books with me. I think about seven or eight, because mm-hmm. uh, I really pack it away as far as reading goes when I'm on vacation. I don't listen to podcasts uh, on vacation, so I'm I'm really behind on that. Mm-hmm. But I, I totally tore through a bunch of books, and one of the ones I read was uh, Hyperspace by Michio Kaku, uh-huh. who's a, a theoretical physicist or, yes. or a cosmologist mm-hmm. or something. I forget its exact title, but he's a, he's a legit scientist. Mm-hmm. And he talks about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in this book, and he talks about the, the many universes idea, and he talks about all of these things. And, and one of the concepts in there that was really mind-blowing for me, and this is a little diversion, but I'll bring it back to Star Trek in a minute, is how it's hard to talk about a lot of this stuff in words, but it's easier to talk about in math. Mm -hmm. And that's something that these physicists always say, and I never quite believed them. (laughs) And and in the book, he says, I'm going to prove it to you. And I thought, oh, this is good. I I can't (laughs) wait, right? And he talks about the Pythagorean theorem, uh, which is something that my kid, who is 11, has done in school. You know, which is that if you have a right triangle and you know any of the two sides, using the simple formula, you can figure out the third side. Yeah. And I thought, okay, that's simple. And he says, well, if you extend it to a four-dimensional figure, I mean, a, a three-dimensional figure like a cube, the the same formula works, or like a uh, like a shoebox object, yeah. like a rectangular mm-hmm. three-dimensional object, that the same formula works. He says, well, what if we did the same math for a four-dimensional object? Now you can't picture that in your head, yeah. But a kid can do the math for that. And I thought, oh, that's right. My kid has done the math for a two-dimensional version. Yeah, I can easily imagine him doing the same formula in three dimensions, and I could write it out and do it in four dimensions. Anybody could, but you can't picture it in your head. Yeah. And anyway, he talks about this multi-universe theory and how when you have these multiple universes that you're creating every moment and every millisecond, there's these mm-hmm. infinite numbers of universes that are being created, which is sort of a mind-blowing idea. And it sort of makes – it made it made me much more accepting of time travel stories – Mm-hmm. in Star Trek. And just as we record this a month ago, I think I had a total change in how I thought about some of these stories because I, I had exposure to some real science uh, where they were talking about some of this stuff. And I just thought it was incredible. And uh, mm-hmm. it was a really nice effect uh, on me. So I would encourage anybody out there, go go read about this stuff. That book's actually a few years old and I'm sure there's other ones. But if, if you need a recommendation, Hyperspace by Mishu Kaku. Very, very good. And uh, okay. So let's talk about another time travel episode, my friend. Let's talk about Timeless. Uh, Now, this is Voyager Season 5, Episode Mm -hmm. 6. And here's the one where we have Voyager crash landing on the ice planet. Uh, We've got a very surly sort of version of Harry Kim. Uh, And also, this, of course, is the episode where your prop that we talked about earlier Mm -hmm. was used as well. So what uh, was special about this episode and why is it on the list? I love the story. It's it's you know it's yet another one where Voyager des- makes another desperate attempt to make it home and fails. Because if you think about it, the, I I I need to go back and actually count how many attempts that were made, and they were failing, and yet they kept persevering and going and going and going. So in this case, you have this another one, but it also just beautifully done. I wish it were a two parter. As a matter of fact, I think uh, Garrett mentioned something to that extent, that it was supposed to be this, <laughs> ironically enough, city in the edge of forever, but for Voyager. I wish it were, but still, they managed to do a lot 
just in that one hour of television. I mean, if you think about it, it has this tiny little crossover with TNG with the appearance of Jordy as the captain. You have basically, you don't know how the whole thing's going to resolve until the very last moment when he sends the wrong, you know, coordinates to dissipate the, the tunnel and boom, they're gone. Basically, it's it's the failed timeline, if you will, because they just obliterate everything. Now, you start thinking about it, how does that reflect on, like, well, basically they just destroyed what is it, close to two two decades of Federation history, if you will, along with them. But then you can start arguing, it's like, well, maybe it was the failed timeline, so it deserved to be argued, uh, destroyed. So you have this whole, there's a lot of questions that can be asked. It's like, uh, when are you justified in changing the timelines? Like, how how does that work? I mean, we sort of assume like these are our heroes. We want them to be, you know, alive, happy, and the journey continues. But... Was it right? Was it wrong? It's a great story. Not to mention, of course, we finally have uh, Kim having, you know, his spotlight, so to speak. He's the one who saves the day at the end. You, you talked about the idea of the failed timeline. Isn't yeah? Isn't the whole idea that that we're already in an alternate timeline? Because isn't it in Deadlock that we get the other Harry Kim who traverses universes? <laughs> oh, I, I could be wrong about it? the episode, but there's some episode. <laughs> was it Deadlock? Here's the thing: something about dead. Yeah, but Deadlock was not. They were copies. That's the thing is that it's not like it was like one was the original copy and the other one was the uh, the, the alternate. Uh, they were they were copies of each other. They were both valid. It's just that they existed in that one. Sp- God, this is they're like Captain Jane was like, I don't like time paradoxes because it's very difficult to figure out, isn't it? <laughs> but in this case, the deadlock was not a time paradox. It was just Voyager got copied and they existed in the same they could not exist simultaneously because it was basically destroying the fabric because one had more, pretty much got all the antimatter that there was just enough for one for one ship to run. But yeah, it's 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 constantly that way. We we do have like I mean, who's who's not to argue? Like for instance, first contact, Picard and and company fixed things, but did they fix them just so, or everything going on once they left? is an alternate timeline. They all are alternate timelines. That's why it's the multiverse. That's why it's so exciting, I think. And yet here we are having all these conversations about canons and prime timelines. <laughs> the the idea in this book that I'd read over the, the holidays was that that basically all universes exist. Yeah. Right? Is that, that there's an alternate universe where everything is the same except one grain of sand on a beach in Bora Bora is, you know, two millimeters to the left. Yeah. And everything else is the same. Right. And if you yeah. sort of can wrap your brain around such an inconsequential change and yeah. the size of that universe, of those mm-hmm. those multiverses, the number that that would be is sort of beyond even our wildest comprehension. Right. And so yeah. once you can sort of get your brain wrapped around the idea that it, there's so many you can't keep count, then why not? Right. There's there's many that are equally valid. Right. There's infinite yeah. Jane ways. There's infinite Kim's. There's yeah. one. There's a heck. There's a universe where he even is, gets a promotion. There's actually one one of the uh, novels, Voyager novels that came out while Voyager was still on the air. So it's one of the first I think there were 23 of them. I could be wrong. 20 plus. So this is this is not post series with what Christy Golden and Kristen Beyer created. This is before that actually had that that exact concept where Voyager counters an issue at the planet. The planet came up with a way of traveling that's basically a form of transporter. But it basically it just was this glitch where at some point in time, pretty much the entire population of the planet was in transit. So they were all kind of like in a state of transport flux, if you will. And it was just it just generated some stuff with with this this multiverses where the away team came back and Janeway realized that at some point it was like um somebody's eye color was wrong because they were they got transported from a different universe and the universe is kept shifting so every time a transport would occur somewhere it, literally a different copy of the person would appear in our so to speak the the, the voyager the original universe and they just basically the entirety of the novel was about how they're going to put everybody back where they belong and that was that was very much what what you're talking about I, gosh what i wonder what the name 
you know, while we're speaking, perhaps I can track it down and see if I can find what the name of the uh, novel was because that was sure if you want I remember, to. I, I was I remember we, we reading can recommend it, it to was, people. Yeah, and like what you were saying, it was incomprehensible because the the, the author was trying to ex- explain this whole concept. They have this this infinite number of these multiverses, and every time the person was shifting, just a tiny little bit would have been different. But the further away you were going away from your quantum signature, so to speak, the more different you did that the, the, this entity, this copy was. So, this, my God, we're talking about uh, heavy duty physics here. <laughs> so, if you want to, while you're doing that, I just want to recommend to listeners if you really want to get a sort of a a, a mental workout. You can download an app on your phone that's called Universe Splitter. What it actually does is split the universe every time you type in a decision uh, into this app on your phone. So you can download the app and you can say something like, uh, should I have the chicken for dinner or should I have the meatloaf? And what will happen is it actually communicates that to a uh, to Geneva where they shoot a photon at a an experiment and the photon actually goes into two different places and exists in two different places at once. Now I am vastly exp- I am not explaining wow. this exactly scientifically correctly, but what happens is the photon exists in both places until it's observed and that's actually what the Heisenberg uncertainty principle it relates to that. And what happens is it actually looks at it observes where the photon is and then it tells you which thing you should do. But you've just made a fork in the universe because there's another universe where the other decision happens. So if it tells you to eat the chicken, there's another universe where the opposite you or actually another copy of you got told to eat the meatloaf. And so every time you're using this app, you're actually causing forks in the universe, if you can imagine. And it's a real thing. It's called Universe Splitter. All right. The uh, novel that I mentioned is called Echoes. Uh, it was Dean Wesley Smith, Christine Catherine Rush, and uh, Nina Kariki Hoffman. And this was number 15 in the 21 novels that came out while Voyager was still on the air. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty wild. It's a great story. Yeah. And speaking of great stories, let's talk about an incredibly great story that people love, uh, which is Darmok, mm-hmm. uh, TNG, Season 5, Episode 2. Uh, what is it about this particular episode that's special to you, Marina? This is the first time that I actually encountered, <laughs> sounds so silly when I say it out loud, that I encountered Star Trek outside of my own little internal world of Star Trek. This was still the, the time that I was an arm, armchair fan, so literally I had no contact with other fans outside of, uh, well, we actually didn't even have uh, social media at the time, so outside of fan pages that I was frequenting at the time. So I was in college and I was taking, it was actually a history class. It was uh, History of Western Civilization Part 1, <laughs> as I recall. Mm-hmm. And the, uh, the history professor was a very interesting gentleman to talk to. And we were starting the ancient uh, Middle East civilizations. And he started the class with that episode. He showed it on, on the, you know, projected it on the screen. And I could tell you i was thrilled i was like oh my god somebody else knows what this is what it means and obviously it was you know there was this connection because we we have this, this story of gilgamesh is actually part of you know it, they do cover it in history classes this this is part of you know it's it's not a historical record but it, it is certainly something because it's so ancient yeah it's ancient literature yeah yeah this was a prelude to ancient middle eastern civilizations now i can tell you that probably 95 percent of the people in class had no clue what was going on and because they oh star trek like the moment i think he said oh this was the episode of star trek the next generation you can just see you know half the people kind of go oh, you know like that sort of like what is this science fiction what is this doing in, in history the, the normies didn't like it yeah, no, but it, and that's that's the thing is that like you know Star Trek is all about this connections, the allegories, the little things where it's like it means more than what I actually read on the page or see on the screen. And uh, I, I'm telling you, I walked out of the class like like floating. I'm like, we had Star Trek in my history class today. It was like the first time. I'm like, okay, there it is in real world. It actually, I mean, outside of like obviously we all know about the, the influence on electronics. I had my my phone at that time already, but it's. Well, the flip phone, that's what I meant. But, you know, outside of that, it was this, you know, here you go, an illustration. It's not hidden. It's not weird. It's not in the basement. Uh, Star Trek and history. 
there you have it. So that that was a thrilling moment. That was like that's why I was like Darmok is always there. Was this it's the fact that the whole idea of first of all having a culture of the unique linguistic abilities or rather linguistic expression, and plus you also have this this whole connection with real human history. So I have to ask, do you believe that any of the other students in the class had their interest peaked by watching this Star Trek episode, maybe seeing an episode for the first time? I think so. The ones that were actually interested in the class probably would have. It, it, the, it's one of those, because it's it's a low-level class, there were a whole lot of people taking it just because they had to take it. Not because they like, oh, I, I really want to take history of Western civilization. It was just something that I need my three credits so I can move on and do other things I need for my major. But the people who were actually taking it because they really liked history. Now, I, I enjoy history. I always have. And I specifically picked the class because I already, well, first of all, I had enough background in it when I, so I thought it was going to be interesting to actually have this. And in English language, because again, at this point, I was like in the country for two years. You know, it was just enjoyable subject matter for me. And this was like a cherry on top. And plus I have Star Trek. The ones who probably who who enjoyed, okay, and great, I'm I'm ready to learn about whatever. And here you have this unusual way of looking at history through lens of science fiction. They probably, well, he showed like half the episode, so literally half the class was was just dedicated to watching the the episode. They probably checked it out. And again, it, it those people who it was the same campus where that student center was that actually had Star Trek on all the time. So who knows? Maybe they encountered it later. It was like, oh, didn't I just see that in class? So who knows? Maybe several more Trekkies were made that day. One can hope. Oh, fantastic. So let's let's compare, and I, I'm going to, this is uncharitable, but I, I, I'm saying this more as a joke than anything else. Let's compare the sublime versus the ridiculous. <laughs> so we've got Darmok, which is sort of this high point of all of Star Trek because of the serious subject matter and sort of this, this very profound lesson about communicating and building bridges with other people. Uh, and really understanding other cultures in a deep and profound way. And this really incredible story about the sacrifice of the of the Temerian captain. Uh, let's compare that to, say, Bride of Chaotica, <laughs> which is a high point of Star Trek in another way. Yes. I, I don't I don't think it would actually categorize it as, you know, sort of the high point of, you know, meaning and feeling and pathos and, and, and all of that, but maybe in comedy and in fun, certainly a, a high point uh, as well. It is. But you wanted uh, to talk about this episode. So let's, let's talk about it. Yes. It is something that I personally adore about Star Trek as a whole is that unlike many other sci-fi, whatever, sci-fi novels and everything, it extremely rarely gets preachy. As a matter of fact, on top of my head, I can't even think about it. Let's face it, a lot of it is allegories and basically just reflecting the circumstances of the day in the very interesting stories. But it also has this ability not to take itself seriously. Because let's say, I mean, Bride of Chaotica is a fun ride. They, it's, it's fun. It's hilarious. It, and, and, you know, that, that is, I can't really think of like what other sci-fi franchise out there that kind of reaches that sort of like you can go from extremely extremely serious concept you know anything you can think of to like literally okay just let it go and let's 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 just have fun for an hour and see these characters just i don't know not be serious I, I, i'm kind of strapped for words because i'm trying to to express just how it's like it's funny it's not you know, highbrow sci-fi concept, you know, like you have with, you know, even like City of the Age of Forever, you know, this, this one's, it's tragic, it's dramatic. But here you have, even though you're still trying to basically, it's, it's, it's about an alien contact, but you have to do it because the aliens came across Tom's <laughs> program and now you have to communicate them through this black and white ceiling. Yes. And of course, Kate just did unbelievable thing with, with, with the character of Arachnia. I, can, I cannot watch this episode without laughing out loud. Every time I watch it. And of course, you know, the whole idea is like that the production value is great. You know, black and white. The first time I actually saw what the actual colors of the costumes were, oh, uh, that, that wonderful book uh, that they released, Star Trek Costumes. Mm -hmm. That's the first time I actually, I think I saw in full detail. Because, you know, you always, like you say, Bride of, Bride of Chaotica, Captain Proton. In your head, it's in black and white. But 
real costumes were you know it was all yeah, they had color it was it was actually beautiful beautiful work by by Robert Blackman so I actually I, you know now that I said that I'm gonna after we're done finish I'm probably gonna go open the book and take a look because it's it's just beautiful so yeah that was uh Bride of Chaotic it's one of those it's like where Star Trek goes silly and does silly really really well I've enjoyed my Voyager watch through, because as, as people know who've listened to the show or who follow me on Twitter, I haven't seen all of Voyager and I've been slowly live tweeting my way through all the episodes and I have been enjoying it so much. Uh, and while there's some episodes I'm critical of, and I certainly am very open about, you know, saying I didn't like this one or I, I do like that one. Th- it's just been glorious overall. And I'm I think this is one of the ones that comes to mind for me as a reason why I'm enjoying Voyager so much is because they do stuff like this, yeah. uh, which I don't think some of the other series really pushed sort of the the level of ridiculous, glorious ridiculousness yeah. that we got here in this episode. So uh, certainly yeah. a favorite of it's, mine as well. It's, it's nice to appreciate the fact that, you know, like here you have this something with a capital S, an important entity you know science fiction part part, important part of pop culture and everything but it has just to repeat myself it has this amazing ability of not taking itself too seriously because we have that i mean look at the the movies some of the stuff that kirk and spock get out to it's it's funny it's great humor great heart you know it's uh one of the reasons i particularly love star trek 3 is because i feel like it has an incredibly serious story it has some incredibly deep and and very powerful uh, emotional moments, but it also has this ridiculous amount of comedy, right? And it's all yeah, these like little yeah. one-liner bits that they throw just, out. Just I, bits, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And you know, people <laughs> say, "Oh, Star Trek Three, that's an odd one, so it's not good." And I'm like, "What are you talking about? You know, it, Star Trek Three is awesome." <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, it's not my show, it's yours. So let's talk about another episode that you picked. Let's talk about Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country from 1991. Certainly a wonderful Star Trek film that gets a lot of uh, kudos from a lot of fans. It, it probably appears on a lot of best of lists, I would think, Mm -hmm. and uh, certainly has some incredible high points that people remember. We get Captain Sulu. We have uh, Mr. Spock. We have Christopher Plummer as General Chang. Uh, We've got just these remarkable performances. David Warner in his, I think, third or fourth uh, guest appearance on Star Trek. I mean, just so many wonderful actors delivering these tremendous performances with a story that is quite substantial and uh, has some some real meat to it. So what about this particular movie is special to you, Marina? It is extremely special, actually. Um, this was one of the first, well, Star Trek in whichever form. I mean, in this case, it's, it happened to be a movie. I, uh, obviously, this is something that I saw way after its release, seeing that I only came to US in 98. So I caught it on, you know, it was shown on, on TV. And I saw it very early on. I'm going to say probably even like end of 98, maybe early 99. Uh, so at this point, Star Trek was this this somewhat nebulous thing that I, I just watched on and off because it's just something that I liked. And again, it kind of helped with the whole language thing and everything. But this was something that hit very close to home because this this was the moment when I watched the movie, especially at the very beginning of it, when I realized it was this, this immediate light went on in my head precisely what exactly Star Trek was. That, you know, it's not aliens and starships. This has very real uh, connections to the real world, to the real people, to the real events. Because, you know, you describe, if I came up to you and said, okay, two major political powers have an equivalent of Cold War, and one of them has a major accident and an energy-producing factory, if you will. And you'll think, well, yeah, that's the beginning of Star Trek VI thing is that it's you know you, you told that to me no that's you know <laughs> soviet union and u.s and we have the chernobyl disaster so that was that was the moment because it was this was a real thing to me a real event and i'm like okay, okay federation is united states and klingons are the soviets and that's exactly what it is especially for the original series because they were somewhat less uh, abstract than the following series, you know, when they represented actual events and actual uh, historical personalities. So, you know, Gorkon is basically, it's the combination between, well, they kind of like a little bit of LinkedIn, but Gorbachev, that's how they combined the names and that's how the name Gorkon actually came out. Gore is the Gorbachev part. 
So that's what you have it. It's, you know, it's the Federation is U.S. and Klingons are the Soviets and Romulans are the Chinese. It's not just aliens and starships. So in that regard, so it still, it still is my favorite movie with the original series crew. And I still love watching it because it's still relevant in many ways because it's just, it's just there. It's that moment in time. And I'm like, okay, Star Trek is not just a television series. It's not just movies. It's not, it has this meaning and behind it a whole lot of meaning as it as it actually turns out you know regardless whether you're going from heavy duty <laughs> episodes to the ceiling as that we talked about it's a lot of things and thank god we have it one of the criticisms i've heard of this film and i, I want to offer this to you just to give you something to to react to is that the klingons that we've seen in star trek especially in tos Mm-hmm. were really, really bad dudes. I mean, if you look yeah. at how, uh, I think it was Kor is in uh, Errand of Mercy. I mean, he's literally rounding mm-hmm. up people in the street and doing mass executions, right? This, mm-hmm. These are very, very bad guys. And in Undiscovered Country, we decide that we're going we're gonna to accept them and we're going to do a deal with them. And one of the criticisms is at no point do the Klingons ever express any contrition for the way that they've acted in the past. Mm-hmm. And, we're, and we're still going to help them out. Yeah. I thought it was an interesting take, but I'd be curious to hear what you have to say about that. A lot of the stuff, I'm sure that <laughs> I wish we had more. I wish they developed Klingons that we didn't have that sudden jump between the absolute minus, if you will, to a more honorable, well, honorable Klingons that we finally get the closer we get to TNG. So I, I, I'm faulting just the production because there was just only that much that they could do. And let's face it, I mean, they had to have a big bad uh, for the original series. So, and Klingons were it. So, yeah, it's a bit of a jarring difference, but I'm sure we can all come up with all sorts of explanations in their head cannons, if you will. I just, you know, Fair enough. The, Fair moment, enough. The, the, moment, the moment that I kind of like, okay, this is how they looking at it, you know, this parallels between the real life politics and what they were expressing, it still worked. So even though, yeah, you're going from this this horrible, it still works. Does that make sense? Okay, sure. It absolutely does. I, I just, I, you know, it's my job as your friendly interlocutor yeah. uh, to give you no, some like, things I, I, to I react can, to. I, I see so what that's, you're getting. That's but, what I try to do. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. It's. Just, I wish we had something between, especially, well, well let's, not, let's not talk about design of Klingons. That's like a whole... Let's not open that. Door. <laughs> but yeah, there's like it's almost like a, a middle bis, a middle missing with you know Klingons becoming from like okay we just see this horrible side of them to like actually uh, seeing a little bit more of the culture and perhaps explanations and like you said some sort of uh, not apology but some sort of development in that regard. But uh, <laughs> that's what we have. We we're just jumping from TOS to what they are in a discovered country. That's okay. That is okay. But now I want to talk about something that's very different, something that we've Mm -hmm. never talked about on Trek Profiles before, uh, which is one of the documentaries. Mm -hmm. Uh, You had selected Love of Spock for us to talk about. This is the 2016 for the Love of Spock. This is the 2016 really biopic by Adam Nimoy about his dad, uh, Leonard, mm-hmm. which uh, I had the privilege of seeing actually at STLV that year when they did a screening of it. That That's how I actually experienced it. Uh, so please tell me why you wanted to talk about this particular film. Certainly very touching and very powerful, but, but what about it is special to you? Extremely powerful. I think this is probably the best up until that moment. Um, you know what? I, I probably wouldn't even compare it. It's, it's in category of its own. Adam managed to do was absolutely singular. This is probably one of the best documentaries, period. And within Star Trek, it's it, it, up until point that point, we did even whatever uh, William Shatner, with all due respect, I mean, he's done the amazing documentary about the captains and all that. But this was, it was just so powerful, probably because Adam was doing it as, you know, how did he phrase it? It was a way to say goodbye, so he could have a closure and the fans could have a closure. So it's it's it, the fact that they did it with the crowdfunding campaign. So the fans actually did have a very measurable part of it. I mean, they, they when when the the titles go down, the credits go down at the end, and you see there's ten thousand plus names at the end. Not to toot my own horn, you know, myself included. And it just you look at it, and it it's it's. It, it's part of the fandom. It's not just this, oh, somebody else, somebody just went out and did this film. No, it's the person who's intimately part of the fandom 
because when he's, he's his son, he was actually director on Star Trek himself. He's part of it. Mm-hmm. And it's done so incredibly well. It's, it's personal. It's intimate. He covered everything A to Z. I had a chance to see it first at Tribeca. It was part of the film festival in New York. And then, of course, um, at the level that I donated at, we actually had a separate showing for the people around New York area, which was held at uh, Leonard Nimoy Thalia Theater. Uh, so, and they did like a, a whole nice Q and A beforehand, and and so he, uh, Adam was actually there talking about it. So it's it's just I love the fact that besides the that it's a really well made documentary just on its own, that's you know production values and everything. It's it's part of the fans are part of it. It's part of the fandom. It's just so intertwined and i i love it i i mean i have it probably like i think <laughs> i have at least one dvd and i have it on, on saved up on my streaming and everything it's one of my favorites uh, just generally track things that i have in my library and i think for anyone who's a, a mr spock fan or a leonard fan watching it you'll get momentarily overcome it's it's yeah. really really well done and it's a it's a beautiful documentary yeah. and i think i would describe it as sort of adam's love letter to his dad i think in a yeah. lot of ways Absolutely. Absolutely. It's just, you know, when he, he reads the letters and everything, it's, it's him rediscovering it. There was a wonderful panel at Star Trek Mission New York in 2016, The Children of Trek. I think it was uh, maybe something similar, but that was the, the uh, uh, gist of it. It was uh, Adam Nimoy, Julie Nimoy, and Rod Roddenberry. And they were basically talking about growing up. And then, of course, Adam creating For the Love of Spock and Rod Roddenberry creating Track Nation, which is his documentary about his finding his father and accepting his own part uh, as being the son of the creator in relation to all these millions of fans that he had to share his father with. So it's, it's this very interesting. It's so like everything in Star Trek. It's so very connected, all of it. It just, it's just—it's beautiful experience. Um, have you seen Trek ne- Nation? Incidentally, I have. It's—it's it's, it's, uh, somewhat, yeah. It's—it's it's different, but it's—it's it's sort of in that same vein when he's trying to reconcile Star Trek, his father, millions of fans. Yeah, because they—they—they they come from very different. It took Rod. He actually said that during that panel. It took him far longer than Adam to kind of accept that. Absolutely. I think Trek Nation had much more of a focus on on the fandom more generally, and there was a lot more other mm-hmm. stuff, whereas yeah. For the Love of Spock was very much focused on, on Leonard, Leonard and yeah. sort of his yeah his story. Uh, but they're both, I would highly recommend them both for anybody out there yeah. who's, who's looking it, for something. It, and you mentioned they showed it during STLV. That was like a completely different experience. You know, watching it in Tribeca, obviously there was fans, but it was uh, sort of like a very limited showing. The showing for the fans was even less so. I mean, there was probably about 50 of us there, something like that. And that, But STLV was sitting in the main theater that seats 6,000 people, and you have all these fans. That was just, oh. It's a very different experience, you know. Completely. I'm, I mean, completely. I'm, I'm reminded of uh, right now as we record this, uh, William Shatner has for the past few years been traveling around doing these showings of Star Trek II, mm-hmm. uh, where then he'll come out and do a little talk afterwards. Yeah. And yeah. it's just, I went to one of those and it's very, I mean, I've seen Star Trek II, I don't know, 30 times. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you pop it on, you, you watch it on the Blu-ray or the DVD or something or on your on your tablet or what have you. But when you go to a theater and you sit in a room with nothing with but fans. Trekkie fans yeah. and the movie mm-hmm. comes up and you watch it together, it's a different experience. You know, it is just yeah. not the same thing. When. Uh, they were releasing uh, the remastered TNG discs, and I wish they did every the same thing with all seven seasons, but they only did it with the first two. They did theater events through um, uh, what's the name? Uh, Phantom Fathom? events. They uh, oh. oh, Fathom. Sorry, yeah, Fathom events. Exactly right. And so I went to both the one for the first season and the one for the second season. Now the second season obviously showed best of both worlds, and but before that, I don't know why they did that because it actually kind of. It's funny. They showed the uh, the mess ups, the the takeoff, the what is it called? The blooper reel. The, the blooper. I'm sorry, I'm losing my mind to this. Yeah, they showed the bloopers before they showed the actual episode. So, and it was at that point, I think the vast majority of them were not seen. I definitely there were some where like people at some point you had well, the theater I went to was completely full. So it was just trackies. It's just completely mind blowing experience. 
people couldn't even laugh anymore. It was so funny. It was just this collective moaning. <laughs> uh, I don't think I've ever ex experienced it. And then, of course, you know, seeing best best of both worlds, even though we all know what happens. It was like, wow, this is just so different when you have other folks with you watching it. Absolutely. So let's talk about uh, another episode. Let's return to TNG and talk about mm -hmm. Inner Light, uh, Season 5, Episode 25. Uh, here we have the Russican Flute. Uh, we have the Mind Probe. We have Picard's Missing 20 Minutes. We have Eileen and Bataille and all of that. Certainly, I think a lot of people's favorites and a, and a very intellectually interesting episode, I think, in a lot of ways and, and very touching as well. Yeah. Um, so what about this episode speaks to you? I liked, I loved what, what it meant for Picard as a, as a character, because at this point, you know, we all know that, you know, he doesn't have family to speak of. I mean, unless you count his crew as his family, which is, it's a completely different dynamic and completely different relationship. But you have this man who's already in his 50s, given a chance to literally experience an entire life. Granted, it's somebody else's life, but he gets to experience it with, you know, becoming a father and having a wife and everything and doing other things. And just what it means for the character. Do you know they actually recommended this episode well, recently on Star StarTrek.com as sort of like one of those things to kind of brush up on as, as sort of this before, before Star Trek Picard premieres? But because of course it's 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 got to be very crucial. I mean, can you imagine what it could do to a person when you literally you you only gone twenty minutes from your actual life, yet an entire lifetime has passed. It's sort of like it's not time travel, but it it's sort of in that same vein when you have this this momentary change that has influence on your future. I I love I love it as far as the as far as character development, what it changes for Picard, how it changes his his probably the the way he 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 proceeds living his life. I mean, obviously it's a, he, it's, it's almost like, I mean, he's at that point in time, especially considering that the probe downloaded all that information. He's basically, you can consider him the only representative of that civilization because at least he has the experience of that culture. You, you go back to encounter at Farpoint and he tells Will Riker mm -hmm. right up front, like, I don't want anything to do with the families or the kids, you know, get them the hell yeah. away from me. Right. And then you have yeah. Picard at the end where he's doing Captain Picard Day. And, you know, he's not comfortable with it, but he sort of made his <laughs> peace with it. I'm a role model. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm a role model. Right. And and he's sort of getting he's 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 blooming into the role that he realizes he has to be yeah. as not just the captain for the starfleet people but the captain yeah. of everybody on the ship right including the civilians yeah and i think that this episode certainly was a it was a catalyst i think for that yeah and uh, which makes the scene in generations when he loses his brother and his nephew that much more poignant because of his his i'm sure his feelings especially you know, i mean especially after brothers and everything else that goes on with his personal relationship with his immediate family members, you know, what that loss becomes because now he has this completely different worldview on things. At least I think so. Yeah. Marina, let's talk about another documentary, which I'm delighted to talk about. You had wanted to discuss uh, what we left behind, the Deep Space Nine documentary, uh, which I thought was an interesting choice to talk about on Trek Profiles. So I'm curious to hear your particular point of view on this documentary. It does fall, it's somewhat similar in the same category as for the love of Spock, the fact that you have this huge involvement of fandom. I mean, in this case, even more so, because if you recall, this whole thing was starting out, that was supposed to be like a small, let's do a 30-minute expose on things. And then this explosion of interest, obviously, uh, I mean, this is Deep Space Nine, where it progressed from little thing, quotation marks, to an actual full-feature documentary film. And of course... It's it's hard to predict what where things are going, but once it was like okay, well, Iris himself is now involved. Something interesting is bound to be had to to happen, and I had a chance to go to the premiere in New York when they were showing it, and it just it blew my mind. I'm like, how can you you know, especially after for the love of Spock, which certainly set a very very high mark on how you can do not only Star Trek documentaries but just generally documentaries. This was just great. But they took it even further because you have this, okay, let's get the people who actually created things and invent the eighth season. 
And, you know, of course, the, the little bits is like, well, the proof of concept, can you actually clean the picture up? You, you can, they actually, the stuff that they did with high definition. So they, they just did things that took it even further than Fellow Love of Spock. And of course, you know, the subject matter, um, I'm, I don't want to complain, but let's face it, out of the TNG era tracks, obviously everybody concentrates on TNG in terms of pretty much everything especially like what we have in releases in merchandise and books and everything. So to have a product that was specific to Deep Space Nine, which um, I don't even remember when we had something else on, of that magnitude that was not TOS or TNG related. That was, that was great to see. I was a big fan of so, it myself and I, uh, I contributed to it and my, my name is in the credits. Yes. And uh, we had, when they were doing the, I'm not sure if it was, fathom or whoever i think they were no no i think i think they actually arranged it themselves to have those showings all across the country mm -hmm. uh our very little small star trek away team i don't even want to call it an away team it's really just a small group of trek fans here yeah. uh, we got together and we went so that was really nice you know to to sit in a room with the other fans and to experience it together uh it was just glorious and great humor i mean there were moments when i was like just sitting and everybody was just laughing out loud because well, that's Ira. <laughs> they just, like I said, they took it to a whole nother level. Uh, highly enjoyable. Again, it's on one of my shelves with the, the favorite things that I have, you know, books and, and discs in, that related to Star Trek somehow, but it's, it's there. So then let's talk about one other episode. Let's talk about uh, a, certainly an interesting pick, I think, Coda. Voyager, uh, Season 3, Episode 15, Janeway in the Afterlife. Uh, now, I know you're a big Voyager fan, so uh, I'm sure you're going to have something interesting to tell us about Coda and why this episode is significant for you. <laughs> uh, in this case, it's not unlike Undiscovered Country. It's the episode that's dear to me because it's a moment of realization. Ironically enough, I mean, it's titled Coda, but, it, you know, it that was the beginning I remember I was watching it, and this was a, actually a rerun, so it was late at night, and you know, I just finished doing my homework, and there it is, and it's, perhaps I just reached the saturation point, because at that point, like I said, I had, there's Voyager, there's Deep Space Nine, and TOS was on PBS, and at college I had, you know, TNG playing in the student center. Maybe I reached a saturation point where it was like, just there was so much track that it kind of, it reach that point of no return but like literally I, I i was watching like i need to know and it's not like i want to know what happens in the next episode i need to know what happens in the next episode and i need to know how it all comes together and what came before that and sort of like now have a more clear picture of what this universe looks like so even though it was a coda <laughs> that was the beginning for me where more or less i reorganized my whole thing and i tried to watch everything chronologically and figure out what all these characters meant and, you know, to each other and what they were. And as well as, you know, like, like I said, the series that came before that. So that's, that's why it's meaningful to me. It was the, the moment of the point of no return that after that, it was like, okay, I'm a Trekkie. Marina, why does Star Trek matter to you? I love the fact that it's so undefinable because, you know, once we, we establish it, that it's more than just, television series in all its various incarnations it means different things to different people which i think it's, it's strength but it's also part of its weakness because that's why we fall into this whole thing with toxic fandom and gatekeeping you know you don't like this thing the way i like it therefore you're wrong it's different things to different people it's you know is it the source of inspiration is it the means of escape is it a uh, means of connecting to someone even your own family is it just uh, finding validation for your own personal philosophies of, of sorts? You know, whichever bridge you that catches you, where you find your home, whichever bridge, you have all of this. So it's start, and the, the fact that it's so hopeful, the, it's so hopeful and inclusive, it allows you to, fires up imagination, allows you to consider possibilities. You know, you can just finish watching and then, your imagination just keeps going in there, what it all meant and what happens next. And uh, especially now that we actually have half a century of it and we all know that we do have all these connections, that there is connections and allegories to whatever happens in the real world, then you're kind of a little bit more aware of it, but you still have that. I mean, I can't wait to see all the new stories that they will come up with in 
third season of Discovery and of most certainly Star Trek Picard, especially Picard. So yeah, it's it's indefinable, it's hopeful, and it's diverse. Star Trek is many things. Well, Marina, I've enjoyed talking to you, but I have to tell you that the M5 is now signaling me that it is time for the Kobayashi Maru. The Kobayashi Maru is a challenging and difficult test, cunningly prepared by the M5. <laughs> Should you not only survive the test, but pass it as well, the M5 will award you an honorary Star Trek title. Are you ready, Marina? Uh, all right, let's do it. M5, load the Kobayashi Maru simulator and prepare to record Marina's responses. Simulation loaded. Now, Marina, I have to tell you that the M5 has brewed up something special for you. We have a fully Voyager-themed Kobayashi Maru, which hopefully you will enjoy. <laughs> so let's go ahead and get started. Question one. Neelix has dinner ready in the crew's mess. Two choices of entree, Hasperat souffle or an especially piquant plomic soup, all made by Neelix. What's your choice? Hasperat souffle. Question two. Hang out in aeroponics or hang out in astrometrics? Uh, astrometrics. Question three. Have a holodeck adventure with your Voyager pals in either Polynesian Tiki Town or Sandrines. Sandrines. Question four. Choose your evening's entertainment. Recital from Harry Kim on his clarinet or dramatic poetry readings from the EMH. Mm, um, I'll, I'll go with Harry Kim. Music. And finally, who is the bigger bad in Voyager, the Borg Queen or Seska? Now remember, this is just Voyager. Borg Queen. Simulation complete, M5. Please compute the results and tell us if our guest has passed the Kobayashi Maru. Analyzing responses. <laughs> I love Polynesian Tiki Town. I, I got to tell you. <laughs> I thought uh, I, I loved. I loved the idea of Sandrine's. I thought it was. Uh, it was very. Actually, it fit with Paris's personality. And I wish they could take it further, but I think they, they could only do it so far before, before it kind of like a reasonable assumption is like, well, the crew's going to be sick and tired of it by now. You know, <laughs> let's come up with something else. But yeah, I would totally shoot pool with Janeway. Oh, that would be awesome. All right. <laughs> fantastic. Well, Marina, I am pleased to tell you that the M5 has determined that you have passed the Kobayashi Maru simulation. Congratulations. Thank you. Yes. And now the M5, who has analyzed your answers, will award you an honorary Star Trek title on behalf of our podcast. M5, what title shall we award our guest? Marina is awarded the title of Chief of Alumni Relations for Starfleet Academy. So there you go. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> it's very, very, very official. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Marina, please tell people how they can get in touch with you if they want to continue the conversation. Uh, you can find me on Facebook and, well, uh, consequently, Instagram. Uh, my full name. Uh, if you wish to use a handle, so it's going to be at Dracorex, D-R-A-K-K-O-R-E-X. And uh, same handle, as a matter of fact, for Twitter. Uh, Twitter is a little bit easier because um, I have an open account. So uh, you can just, you know, you can see my posts, you can comment, you can do whatever. Uh, Facebook is locked, actually, to my friends. Um, and, of course, uh, you can also find, uh, well, I co-host, as uh, John so graciously mentioned, uh, Shoreleaf, uh, your Star Trek convention community podcast, uh, which you can find um, under this very long name on Facebook and also at Shoreleaf on Twitter. Um, make sure to check it out. And if you do have any questions about conventions, especially STLV, feel free to reach out. Marina, thank you so much for being part of Trek Profiles. Thank you so much for having me, John. And thank you, listeners. Here ends this installment of the Trek Profiles podcast. And before we offer a Trek quote to close this episode, I'd like to remind you that you may send us your secret winning Caddiscott strategies, your manifestos against the Star Trek canonistas, or your homemade twerking videos while wearing your Mugatu cosplay to feedback at trekprofiles.com or on Facebook or Twitter at Trek Profiles. Anything you send us may be used in the show, or it may be inserted into a photon torpedo case and launched at the Genesis planet. This time, I leave you with a quote from the episode Bride of Chaotica, where Captain Janeway as Queen Arachnia says, quote, Ah, I see you've kept my pheromones. I didn't realize you were the sentimental type. Close quote. 
Thanks for listening and live long and prosper. This handcrafted podcast is brought to you by Stars and Sky Media Lab. It's cosmic. Uh, then we're going to get into episodes. Now, you sent me a giant list, Marina, and we're not going to be able to talk about all those. Yes. And they, uh, I have to kind of explain because as I, I, I tried to kind of point out at it, a lot of these are like literally moments. Some of them are like, OK, it's like some sort of major revelation. Others, it was just something that, you know, people say, well, what, what's your favorite thing? And it immediately pops up because it was something that either something happened or it was something that just got stuck into my head. Or it was the first time that I was like, oh, OK. I feel this thing about the character or an episode or the series or just generally about the fandom. So like some of them can be like literally a two sentence explanation that they're very brief. So it's like we, we can we can we can pick out whichever ones it's. Uh, OK, well, I made some picks. <laughs> Here's something just just to very quickly. Well, I, I again, I, I don't have any time constraints, so I don't want to take up your time. It's OK. Um, uh, the reason the ones like that, that I included. Coda, ironically, is the episode that I hold dear in my heart because that was why ironically, because that was the moment when I realized that not only that I deeply care about characters, so not only I want to know what happens next in the next episode, I need to know what happens in the next episode. I need to know what came before that because as it will come up, I'm sure, in the conversation. I, I watched Star Trek very achronologically. So it was like bits and pieces, which in terms, you know, as far as Voyager and TNG is concerned, because it's not, it doesn't have arcs. It was pretty haphazard. Uh, so that's why, if it just kind of can kind of come up, because sort which, of like which my one? discovered country was Coda. Oh, Coda. Just, I, I remember watching it and I turned it off. I'm like, okay, now I need to know what happens to to, to the captain. I need to know what came before that. I need to know what happens after. And Darmok was a fun one because it came up in my archaeology class. One question, which is I saw you were talking about a thing on Twitter, so I want to make sure. Uh, give me the pronunciation of your last name. <laughs> it's supposed to be uh, Kravchuk. But uh, the Kravchuk. anglicized version, Kravchuk, yes, but Kra Kravchuk is perfectly acceptable. I mean, we've been in the country for more than 20 years. That's sort of- I want to do it the way that, that you want it done. So you you tell me how you want it done uh, and I will do my best. It's up to you. I, I'm do, usually pretty you know, good. It, it, uh, you introduce me the regular way because otherwise people will at first would be like who, uh, but then you if you feel like saying but it should be actually pronounced somehow working into it. Okay. Uh, yeah, because I come from another country, that should be a fun perhaps a little bit that somebody besides Thad <laughs> might want to know. Um, okay. But yeah, it just a lot. You know, people see it and that they will recognize it. Gotcha, gotcha. So I'm going to divert for just a second to tell you that I spent the summer uh, <laughs> living with a guy who was a, uh, a a Russian exchange person who worked at a summer camp that I used to work at every summer, and and we were we were roommates. Oh wow! And uh, this was in the time when the Soviet Union was still around, and he taught me to say two things, mm -hmm. uh, and and he loved that I would say these things because then he would respond with every English curse word that that we, he knew that we had taught him. <laughs> Uh, and the first was, I'm not going to attempt the, the Russian. Well, maybe I will. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. But the first thing he taught me was how to say KGB. And then he would immediately start cursing in English. And the other was the glorious Soviet Navy. <laughs> and so he said those two things would send him off the deep end. So in the unlikely event that he is listening oh, to this, uh, my friend Viktor Koshenko, I'm still thinking about you and how you taught me uh, how to say Slava Sovietsky Flut. <laughs> and Komitet Kosudor Venoy Bezopesnosti. He taught me to say those two things. It's the only two things I know. So there you go. Um, well, so, do you know I, well, by any chance? Was he from Was he from Russia? Russia? Was he was from one of the? Republics? Oh yeah. Oh no. He he was he was a he was oh, a one hundred percent okay. Russian guy. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but anyway, <laughs> of all uh, things to teach. To teach an American that those two things. <laughs> well, because because they made him so angry whenever he was back home in the Soviet Union, they would start talking about, you know, the glorious Soviet, uh, you know, armed forces. And his brother was in the <laughs> Navy. So he, he just used to get wrapped around the axle whenever anybody, you know, back home 
to him in the Soviet Union would start talking about, you know, because apparently that was a big word that the Communist Party liked to use, Slava, glorious. Yes. Oh, they, yes. They used it for everything. Oh, it was glory, glory to everything. Exactly. Right, right, yeah. right. So he, no, the reason I'm asking is that, uh, the, you know, Russia, Russia or anything else is that it, it is uh, quite a misconception. A lot oh, of no, times absolutely. people like they can hear you speaking Russian, they identify it and then it's like, oh, but it's like there is there are a lot of ethnicities living in the former Soviet Union. Exactly. And so even in the, uh, the country that we know today is Russia has a lot of diversity in it, too. But people oh, aren't, aren't aware of that. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how many people know this. The surface of Russia is actually larger than the surface of Pluto. Now, is that an indicative how big Russia is or how small Pluto is? That's entirely up to you, but <laughs> it's big. So you, you mentioned your sister, who I've met, a delightful person. So my mm -hmm. question for you, oh, thank you. is, is uh, her, and her name's Olga, is that right? Do I remember correctly? Yeah. And here's another you know, little piece of trivia, properly pronounced Olga because L gets palatalized. There's actually an additional letter in Russian, but unfortunately, when you transliterate it, <laughs> that letter disappears and it becomes only four. So Olga, again, is, is acceptable as far as I know, because that's what she uses in her everyday personal and professional life. And uh, you're absolutely right. She is a delightful person. She's my favorite sister. <laughs> 